Welcome to the Audiation in the Wild podcast with your hosts, Bo Talifer and Eric Rasmussen. Season 2, Episode 7, Special Guest, Molly Gebrian. For today's episode of Audiation in the Wild, we are joined by Dr. Molly Gebrian. Dr. Molly Gebrian is a professional violist with a background in neuroscience. Her area of expertise is applying the science of learning and memory to practicing and performing. Given this expertise, she is a frequent presenter on the neuroscience of practicing at conferences, universities, and music festivals in the U.S. and abroad. She hosts a popular YouTube channel on the science of practicing and has published papers on these topics in the Journal of American Viola Society, Flute Talk Magazine, and The Strad, among others. She has also published research articles on the intersection of music and early language acquisition in Frontiers in Psychology and the Oxford Handbook of Music and the Brain. As a violist, her performing is focused on promoting the music of marginalized composers, particularly those from groups traditionally underrepresented in classical music. Her first album, Trios for Two, featuring six world premiere recordings, was released in 2017, recorded with longtime collaborator, pianist, percussionist, Danny Holt. It was named one of the top 100 albums of 2017 by influential music critic, Ted Gioia. I apologize. Uh, I think I just butchered Ted's last name. <laughs> so this was a very fun conversation. Um, if you have any inclination for tinkering with different practice techniques and adjusting your practice philosophy based off of scientific research, I think you're going to love this. I've been following Molly's work for a couple of years now, and I can safely say that more than any other individual, her work has restructured how I engage in music practice. And so I really hope you enjoyed today's episode and let's get to it. Okay, dokie. Well, Molly, it's lovely to have you on the podcast. You have the honor of being the first uh, neuroscientist on this podcast, which I'm sure you have that honor in a lot of places you find yourself in. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I'm not a neuroscientist. I have a neuroscience background, but I'm not because I don't have a PhD in neuroscience, right? So. Oh, interesting. Okay. Well, I, I think you qualify more as a neuroscientist than I do for sure. Okay, that's fair. <laughs> Uh, so I reached out to you by email, I think it was just over a year ago, and we had some interesting exchanges, and you recommended some books, and uh, yeah, I, I've just been really inspired uh, by your work. I, I went down this rabbit hole a few years ago of just reading everything I could about the psychology and science of how people learn, how people practice, and I had, you know, I discovered a lot of these things like interleaving and the spacing effect and mass first block practice and but i never heard musicians talk about it right um, yeah it's not yeah. talked about it's kind of unbelievable which is very surprising considering the the size of the research literature right um, especially with like uh, sports psychology and, and all that so I, I first got into this from the bulletproof musician yep noah kagiyama kagiyama noah kagiyama yeah Kage yeah which his materials are uh Amazing. Amazing. Excellent. Yes. Excellent. I consider yeah. myself a Noah super fan. So me, me too. <laughs> as well. uh, so I stumbled upon your work and I was just blown away by how thorough you were with all these topics and your work's really inspired, um, you know, my own experimenting with practice because we have a lot of research and, and hopefully we get to talking about some of this stuff, but there's not a lot specifically on how these processes unfold with musicians. So we're still kind of at the point personally where we do have to do some experimentation and, and use this research and see how it affects our, our own practice sessions. Yeah, absolutely. And I love that you're experimenting. I think musicians are so reluctant to experiment on themselves because like you, you've been doing something for a long time that works well enough right? And so you're kind of reluctant to try something else new that may not work and may backfire, and then you're not prepared for your gig or whatever. But I think like you have to experiment on yourself. I, I'm, yeah. experiment, I'm experimenting on little children. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's my... Actually, I mean, that is, that is an interesting byproduct of all this. Not only, I mean, if you're a music teacher, not only are, will you probably be experimenting with your own practice schedules, you have the opportunity. I mean, I've A-B tested stuff with students. Um, 
group, which uh, I'm not getting consent, but you know, <laughs> I, I, I try not to have a control group where there's there's someone doing nothing because I, I feel like that would be somewhat unethical. unethical yeah. But, <laughs> but you know, uh, there's if there's two ways to practice something and two kids are working on the same song, it's it's kind of fun to send two of them doing one way and two of them doing the other way and see what happens over a couple of weeks. And this is not tightly controlled, but it is quite fun. To yeah. Do. No, I experiment on my students all the time. And I, I mean, I say this to them, like, especially when I teach pedagogy, um, I say, like, I'm experimenting on you guys all the time. Like, sometimes I'll get an idea in a lesson and be like, huh, I wonder if this will work. And I'll just, you know, try it out. And if it does work, then it's like, oh, that's interesting. I wonder if it just works for that student or if it will work for other people, too. I've never done A-B mm -hmm. testing, though. I, I rarely have students working on the same thing at the same time. Um, yeah, and of the same skill level, too. So there's that. Yeah, there's there's a lot that goes in. It, I mean, if you're teaching brand new beginners, you can often yeah. get into that. Totally. So it's quite fun. Um, so maybe maybe just in terms of of practice techniques or, or or things to know about when practicing you know we talk about we have variable practice mass versus block the spacing effect what do you think is the most counterintuitive thing maybe we'll go through that little list and because we talked about musicians not wanting to experiment and try new things and some of these uh, if you talk to musicians who have been playing for a long time will adamantly resist it oh yeah yeah yeah. I mean, I think the two most counterintuitive things to me are the necessity of taking breaks that you learn the most, like the brain is changing during the break, um, and interleaved practice. I think those are sort of the two most counterintuitive and the ones that the music that musicians tend to be the most resistant to because it really flies in the face of a lot of tradition around how you should practice. So maybe to help the listeners, we'll, we'll unpack some of this vocabulary. So, uh, so we have we have we have mass and block practice, yep. and 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 serial practice, and interleaved and random practice. So maybe could you help us understand what each of these are? Yeah, and, and, and what some of the biases are in the in the practicing communities around these? Yeah, absolutely. So mass and block practice are usually this, considered the same thing. So that's essentially you're concentrating on one thing for a long period of time. You know, you pick. <clears throat> I'm going to work on this passage, and you practice it for I don't know half an hour, let's say. And then you move on to something else and you don't really revisit that passage you were working on until tomorrow or, you know, whatever. Um, the opposite of that is what's known as interleaved or random practice. Those words aren't quite synonymous, but for our purposes, they're synonymous. Um, mm -hmm. And when you're doing that kind of practice, you are switching frequently between different things. So it could be different passages. It could be different skills. Um with the idea that you're sort of um you're making your brain reconstruct from scratch often wait how do i do this again what is this passage and the switching is difficult right we're not used to doing that we're used to just focusing on one thing for a long period of time and breaking it down doing lots of repetitions but when you have to switch often your brain you know really has to switch gears and it helps reinforce it more um solidly in your memory and in your ability it doesn't feel good to do at first mm -hmm. one of the related to this another really counterintuitive thing about practicing is how well you practiced is not measured by how good you sound or how good it feels at the end of your practice session it's measured by how good it feels when you come back the next day and that is really hard to wrap your brain around and i think that is at the root of the very common experience of you feel like you had a great practice session. You feel like, yes, okay, I can play this. This is awesome. And then you come back the next day and you feel like you have to start all over again. Or you go to your lesson the next day and it's a disaster. And you're like, what is going on? It's because how you play at the end of your practice session is not an accurate measure of how well you practiced. And I think a lot of musicians have experienced this. You're in the practice room. You're just it everything has coming together the stars aligned you go to show your teacher the next day wah, wah. <laughs> right exactly <laughs> like, i swear i had this <laughs> right exactly and that's where this sort of masked versus <clears throat> random practice thing comes in masked practice you know you do something for i don't know 30 minutes whatever like at the end of that you feel like yes i have this but no you just had it in the short term because you've been doing it so much for a short period of time just like, you know, if I tell you my phone number and you rehearse it over and over in your head, you're going to think, oh, yeah, I totally know her phone number. 
And then the next day, you're like, wait, what was that phone number? I didn't write it down. Like, you know, I don't know that. Mm -hmm. Whereas with the phone number example, like, you know, if you rehearsed my phone number for a little bit in the morning and then you rehearsed it again in the afternoon and again in the evening or something like that, you'd be much more likely to remember it the next day because you had to keep revisiting it. So there there are two things that come up here. Uh, well, well, there's a couple of things. So we have this distinction between momentary increases in performance yep. and long-term yep. learning. And and related to that is this, uh, I think Robert Robert and Elizabeth Bjork, they, they're memory researchers. Mm -hmm. I think they're out of UCLA, but yeah. I could be mistaken. Um, they talk about these the metacognitive illusions that come yeah. up in the learning process. So what often happens in mass and block practice, you have this, you have this illusion. It's like, well, I'm really getting this. Like it feels fluent. It feels familiar. And you're actually performing well in the moment. But we take that as a metric of long-term learning and it's not necessarily a, a reflection of how much we're going to retain or what we'll be able to do in a week. And so there's a real illusion taking place. It's not, uh, it's not like people aren't experiencing. There's a reason for why people think mass practice is often just hands down better. Yeah. Uh, oh, this totally. illusion is very powerful. It is. Yeah. It's called the illusion of mastery, which I love because it's you like you said, it is an illusion. You think, yes, I have this. And it's, it's a very powerful illusion. Right. Mm -hmm. It's a very powerful illusion. You don't actually know if you have it until you can't come back the next day. And mm -hmm. the other thing <clears throat> that is really hard to wrap your brain around when you do mass practice, you get this really strong illusion of mastery that you're like, yes, I have this. I can play this really well. When you do interleaf practice, you have the opposite. You have the illusion. It doesn't have a name in psychology, but you have the illusion of non mastery or whatever you want to call it. You have this illusion that, wow, I really cannot play this. This is really hard. I'm really struggling. And then you come back the next day and it's much better. And that it's just very, a, a very weird experience. Yeah, it, it, it is. And, and I think on top of this, um, the, the subjective sense of how well you're doing and how much you're learning, there's also this cultural reinforcement that, well, we need to focus on one thing at a time. And if you're switching back and forth between things, I mean, that, that is bad to do for some reason. And I often quiz students I'll, I'll, when I'm teaching on Zoom. I'll, I'll pull up a whiteboard and I'll, I'll say, okay, here's, here's version A of you. Here's version B of you. This one practices for half an hour straight. This one goes 10 minutes, does something else for an hour, 10 minutes, or, or even more aggressive, five minutes of this, five minutes of that, five yeah. minutes of this. And I ask them, which one do you think is going to learn better? And I think a lot of them are saying the masked one will learn better, not not necessarily because of their own insight, because they have this cultural message that they have to be focusing on one thing at a time. Uh, and I'm not recommend I'm not recommending you interleave practice with Facebook, uh, <laughs> but I, I don't I don't know about that being effective. But yeah, I do think there is a cultural message that you you kind of to be serious, you have to do one thing at a time, and this does bleed in subtly to your decisions about how you schedule your own practice session. Oh yeah, totally. Um, and this also now is starting to connect to this other idea of taking breaks, because um, these these two things interleave practice and taking breaks like on purpose to help you learn they are related they're slightly different but they are related in order to learn anything or to get better at anything there have to be physical changes that happen in the brain and if there's no physical changes learning hasn't happened the brain needs rest to make those physical changes the analogy that i often use is with road construction so they can't be like ripping up the road and having people drive on it that's just like simply not going to work right it's the same thing in our brains in order for our brains to do the reconstruction it needs to to support our learning it needs us to take a break um <clears throat> the ultimate break is sleep right but also like small breaks through through the day and so you know, the, these cultural messages you're talking about, I think like serious music students think, okay, I need to be practicing for like two to three hours and I need to find a block of time, you know, every afternoon or something or every night, I'm going to go sit in the practice room. I'm going to practice for three hours straight. That is the least effective thing you can do because you're not taking breaks, right? It's also going <clears> to <throat> hurt you physically, but you know, it's much better in terms of your practice day to do a little bit in the morning, a little bit in the afternoon, a little bit in the evening. So you have these breaks in between. Now, I have a couple of questions about about this. This has been on my mind for the past few years now. Um, when we talk about taking breaks, you could think about it as taking breaks from playing your instrument in general or taking breaks from pieces. Right. Right. And and that's a topic that's come up. Uh, so 
somewhere in in one of your materials you talked about long-term potentiation and i want to talk to you about this because you're the literally the first person that introduced this into my life a lot of these other things i had heard about and then when i found you i was like yes someone else knows about this (laughs) but long-term potentiation was like it was brand new for Uh me and could you help us understand what that is and why why knowing about that might introduce different schedules in terms of okay i'm going to practice this piece for an hour total today but maybe i want to do 20 minutes in the morning and then take an hour or two off and then 20 minutes again and then and, and so what exactly is long-term potentiation yeah so long-term potentiation is sort of the first step in neurons in your brain being able to communicate more effectively so you can do whatever you're trying to do more easily um I sort of think of it like, I don't know, like upgrading your internet or something. So it's just a faster connection. Um, But there are changes that happen at the synapse. So the place where two neurons come together to talk, there are physical changes that happen at the synapse um, that that cause long term potentiation, this this event that happens that just makes it easier for the neurons to talk to each other. And like there's proteins that are inserted into the cell wall and we don't have to get into the neurobiology because it's not important. But um, the first step of getting better at something is neurons being able to talk to each other more easily. And that requires physical changes. Um, There are experiments that they've done where they'll simulate a, a group of neurons like learning something basically. It's not, it's just a bunch of cells in a dish, but it's, it's not like in a brain, but um, they simulate this. And what they find is that different neurons undergo long-term potentiation at different thresholds. Um, And so they'll simulate um, learning by zapping these neurons with a bunch of electricity, basically. And some of the neurons undergo long-term potentiation, which means they're talking to each other more effectively, meaning it's easier for you to do whatever you're doing. But not all of them do. And the reason some of them don't is they don't have the building materials right there ready to go to do the long-term potentiation, to make those physical changes. And so they have to wait for a while, basically, because the, the physical materials need, a, need to commute, basically, to get there. Just like if you're at a construction site and you run out of wood and the, the supervisor is like, come on, build, build, build. It's like, well, we don't have any wood. Like somebody has to go to the store and get the wood. We can't do anything until this person comes back from the store. It's the same thing with the neurons in your brain. They need a period of rest, essentially, where the cells can move these building materials to the neurons so that they can benefit from further learning and more neurons can undergo long-term potentiation. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. It's, it's a complicated topic. I'm, I'm getting the, the, the feeling of uh, familiarity with the explanation. So I, I don't know if I could retrieve it on my own yet. But <laughs> right. It's, it's something there. And I remember you saying something about it, there may be something in the hour-long window, like as a minimum for, for this construction process to take place. So if I was going to practice for half an hour on a certain piece, uh, it may be useful to take at least an hour break before I return to it. Right. Yeah. On the, on the research that sort of simulates learning and look, looks at the time course of long-term potentiation, some of the neurons undergo long-term potentiation right away. If you zap them with electricity again, like 10 minutes later, it doesn't do anything. But if you wait for an hour and zap them again, which again is simulating learning, then more neurons will undergo long-term potentiation, which means that um, they're communicating more effectively, which means you can do whatever the skill is with more ease. And the hour-long break seems to be necessary because that's how long it takes to move those building materials to the cell wall. So they have the building materials that are necessary to do long-term potentiation. And if I'm recalling correct, there's also seems like there's a ceiling to this effect where after you do this three times, it doesn't seem to get like you get diminishing returns where you you almost just might as well practice a different piece. Right, exactly. Yeah. In in the research on this, they can they'll zap the neurons and some will <coughs> undergo long term potentiation, wait an hour, zap them again, more <coughs> excuse me, undergo long term potentiation, zap them again, even more will undergo long term potentiation, wait another hour, zap them again, nothing really happens. Um, And so it seems like after sort of three times, at least in this research, that all the neurons that are going to undergo long-term potentiation in this sort of shorter time course, 
have already, and so you might as well do something else. Um, you're not gonna you're not gonna get any further benefit from like you know hacking away at this thing. Mm -hmm. Which is you know it starts getting into this topic of taking breaks because I I think a lot of people have this idea just the more time I put into it and the more repetitions even though under a lot of context we're learning that putting more time into deliberate practice will produce better skills but there's some nuance to this i mean just just doing more and more repetitions is is might not be as strategic as as taking a well-timed break whether within the day over or over long periods of time which is a whole another can of worms a whole another can of worms yes which we can talk about if you want because that's yeah i mean i think i don't know i think people simultaneously think okay like if I could practice for 12 hours straight and just like keep hammering it away at it, like it would just keep getting better and better and better and better. But at the same time, I think people realize that that's not actually true, right? That mm. you need to like, you, you can't, you can't just practice for 12 hours straight and have that be equivalent to 12 separate days of one hour of practice each on those separate days that I think we have this intuitive sense that like, yeah, after when you come back to it the next day after you've slept or something it's different than just doing it all at once in a day and yet people persist in like okay i just have to hammer at it hammer at it hammer at it in a day and why am i not getting better well you need to sleep your brain needs a break before we get into the the longer spacing effects i want to and i know we're extrapolating from you know research on cells being stimulated yeah. uh in a dish here to practice uh strategies but i think i think it, it does at least give you some idea of what's worth experimenting with. Even oh, if yeah. you don't have, yeah. And my experience personally has been, it's a much better way to practice. Oh, much better. Enjoyable, requires less repetition. But one, one thing I've, I've, I've often wondered if I, if I work on something for, you know, a sizable chunk of time, 20 minutes or half an hour, and, and I'm using other techniques, I'm not just blindly kind of playing it over and over again. Can I get the effect of long, of, of this of this kind of three times daily sprinkled long-term potentiation by just reviewing um, the same passage for five minutes later in the day or for a couple minutes like is it actually necessary to do a full-blown uh, new intense block because my my own experiments show that it, it's not necessary but I I'm not basing this is off you know this is n of one right yeah I mean I have an n of one too because I've done the experiments on myself and <clears throat> they're like you were saying at the beginning like there isn't a lot of great research on a lot of this on musicians specifically um but i find the same thing i i generally have like one main practice session on a given thing and then i revisit that thing several times like throughout the day and when i come back to it later in the day or later in the same practice session yeah it's only for like you know two minutes five minutes just to sort of check in on it see where it is but even that very short revisiting is way better than just doing it once in the morning and then not touching it again like till the next day um yeah so i we have an end of two i guess because <laughs> we've both we've both done this experiment and it's come out the same <laughs> Uh, so just as, and this is an anecdote, but personally, so I, I went from a couple of years ago, you know, working on classical guitar pieces in, in very like serious deep work blocks of 60 minutes and 90 minutes with little breaks in though. But then over the past year or so, I've switched to, you know, I really work on something for like an individual piece for 20 minutes, take a break, work on it later for five minutes, later for five minutes. And I found that I practice less and I found, and and it played better and i have some um I've, I've been getting a classical guitar degree through the royal conservatory and i have some um uh, evidence that my my performance was actually getting better from using these strategies so i was getting higher grades on the exams in and the, and the exams were um scaled so they're getting more difficult right so i'm doing more difficult exams practicing less by just intelligently placing when i'm practicing and I have I have at least one person uh, judging my performance, saying you know it is actually better. It's not just totally in my head. So, yeah, I mean that was very inspiring. Yeah, to, that is. See. Yeah, yeah, that's exciting. Yeah, yeah very exciting. So um, so we're talking about arranging practice in one day and and reviewing something three times in a day, but we can also look at this spacing effect over longer periods of time. And this is I think one of the areas you were saying taking breaks is counterintuitive, but like. How many how many classical musicians do you know that work on a piece for a day or two and then drop it for a week? Just me. On purpose. <laughs> Just me. Uh, yeah. 
Uh, I'll show you. Uh, our, unfortunately, our, our listeners can't see this, but my schedule, you know, up here. Oh, nice. So, so I have my, I have my. I'm looking at a schedule. It goes from Monday, Tuesday, you know, all the way through the days of the week. And I just have a little circle on the other side, and I check it off every time I've done the piece, and I try to get to three times. Mm-hmm. But I, I track the pieces like that on a weekly basis, and then once in a while I skip a week. So yep. there's like a two week gap. Yep. And. I mean, this is just so odd for many musicians because people tend to practice the pieces every single day and they're almost paranoid if I take a day or two off of this, like things will just vanish suddenly. Uh, And and how do you start a conversation with somebody, you know, at at least on some kind of theoretical level where it's related to some kind of, you know, brain processing? It's it's, it's not just, uh, you know, take breaks, it's good for you, but like what's, what's the actual reason? taking breaks like this is good for people. Yeah. So the, like we were just talking about, like the brain has to do physical reconstruction and it needs you to take a break to do that. The ultimate break is sleep. There's a lot of stuff that goes on in the brain um, during sleep. And we know this both from research on sleep that shows, you know, people will practice one day, get a full night of sleep, come back the next day. And their, their ability is much higher than what you would expect just like linearly like okay they've practiced more they've gotten a little bit better there's a huge jump they're always measuring speed and accuracy so there's a huge jump in both speed and accuracy beyond way beyond what you would just expect by the passage of time because when they um give people the equivalent passage of time that does not include sleep so say learn it at 10 a.m do it again at 10 p.m that's a 12 hour break you only see minimal improvements. Obviously, you see improvements because when you practice more, you get a little bit better. But if you do 10 p.m. to 10 a.m., that's also 12 hours. But there's sleep in the middle. That's when you get this huge jump in ability. You also see the opposite when you deprive people of sleep, um, that either they get worse or there's they, they just stay the same. There's no improvement whatsoever. Um, so sleep is really, really powerful in terms of enhancing what you did, you know, during the day in your practice and you'll come back the next day and it's at a much, much, much higher level. Um, I say to my students all the time, because they're always thinking that they need to practice like in these big, huge blocks of time every day. And I say, no, it's going to be way better if you just practice like 10 minutes each day and do a little bit each day. So you give your brain input that it can do stuff with essentially when you're sleeping and then you'll be at a higher level the next day. If you do 10 minutes every day, you get seven boosts over the course of a week rather than, you know, you practice one day for 70 minutes and another day for 70 minutes. You're only going to get two boosts. Exactly. But there's, there also, there also seems like there's benefits to, um, just actually skipping days oh, for, yeah. for certain pieces. I'm not, I'm not necessarily advocating not practicing each day, but, but <laughs> when you're working on specific pieces, like a- after you have some level of competence, I mean, even taking a week off, which sounds absurdly long for, for most musicians, um, the skills tend to just keep. Yeah, they do. It's, it, it feels like <laughs> They like marinate. I, this, I talk about this in one of my videos, but this was the subject of a pandemic experiment I did on myself back in very early days of the pandemic, April, 2020, because this research on sleep and taking big, long breaks like this, like I had known about it, obviously, but I was honestly too scared to try it. Like I'm going to take a week off from practicing a piece that I'm preparing to perform. Like that is a terrible idea. Like, no, you know, but then pandemic happened and all of my concerts got canceled, just like everybody, right? I had nothing on the horizon for performing. And I was like, well, this is the perfect time to try this because if it backfires, it really doesn't matter because I don't have any concerts. Um, and that's when I started really experimenting with taking days off, weeks off, not from practicing altogether, although I did start taking days off from practicing altogether, um, but from you know a specific passage or a specific piece or whatever. And yeah, it's amazing. You take a week off and you come back and it's not only is it not worse than when you left it, it's better than when you left it. And it feels so much more secure. It's like, oh, I can just play this. Okay. That's nice. Um, it's really, it's a really odd experience. I I think this also gives some validity to how, you know, these world-class performers who know absurd amounts of performance repertoire are able to maintain this right? because at some level is, I mean, is it just individual like genius memory that's enabling them to hold onto these pieces or are they actually tapping into something? Uh, and I've met uh, personally, cause I'm a guitarist. I've met so many classical guitarists who like you ask them about a piece and they're like, Oh yeah, I haven't played that in like six months or a year. And it's, 
it's quite secure. Right. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. I mean, every time every time you come back to something after a break, it further cements it in in memory. Um and there's this thing called the forgetting curve, which basically when you learn something brand new, it's really easy to forget it like almost immediately because it hasn't been in your brain very long, basically. But the longer you've known something, the longer you remember it for, essentially. And if you are learning something new and you let it get to the point of almost forgetting, but not actually forgetting, and then you reinforce it through further practicing or studying or whatever, it helps it some it helps you cement it much more um solidly in your brain than if you had been reminded like immediately of that thing when it's still fresh in your mind. So an example I often use is, you know, when you go to a party and you meet new people, they introduce themselves and you promptly forget their name, right? Oh, we all do that, right? And you're like, oh God, this is terrible. If you met someone and they said, hi, my name is Mary. Hi, Mary, nice to meet you. And then two seconds later, they were like, hi, my name is Mary. You're like, Yes, I, I know. You just told me your name. You don't have to tell me. But if they introduce themselves and then they walked away and, you know, 15 minutes later, you're like, oh, God, what was that woman's name? I totally don't remember. And then you hear her introduce herself to someone else. Hey, my name is Mary. Oh, Mary, right. Because there was that chance for you to forget, you're going to remember it much better when you hear herself introduce herself again, uh, because you almost forgot, but it was re it was kind of re-upped in your memory. Yeah, and it, it seems like, I mean, we can put our pop evolutionary psychologist hats on for a moment, which is always fun to do and say, you know, this is just a very parsimonious way for the brain to determine what it should be holding on to and totally. what it should not be holding on to. It's, it's quite amazing when you look at it through that lens. Right. To- um, I mean, yeah, it- that makes a lot of sense. Like you see something evolutionarily, you see something once, like probably not that important to remember unless it was like life threatening and then you're going to remember it. But if you keep seeing the same thing, like once every few weeks, like your brain is like, oh, wait, this keeps coming up. Maybe I should maybe I should remember this. Now, my own thoughts on this, I've never heard anyone talk about the relationship between like, I don't know what you want, novelty and interest and taking breaks. But there does seem like there's also this parallel path of being disinterested in things. And I've I've kind of thought, well, maybe maybe a way that the brain kind of naturally gets you to pull back from something is to make you less interested in it temporarily. Because I've often found if I, you know, I'll get really into sleep research for a couple of weeks and then I just like, I, I've hit the bottom of the mind. Like I can't, uh-huh. like my brain just, it's not interested in more information or there's, you know, if something's not lighting up, but then I take a break for a few weeks or, or even a couple months in this case. And then I come back to it and I'm, the interest is just like really there. And I've often wondered if that's, something the brain is doing to help encourage people but I, I again i've never heard really people talk about that but it seems you know remotely plausible oh definitely i mean there's a thing called habituation where if you like get the same input over and over you'll just start zoning out because your brain is is bored and um you, you they do a lot of research on this with babies like they'll they'll play them like they'll play them a sound over and over and the babies pay attention for a while but then they get bored and if a different sound comes in, they'll play, pay attention to that different sound, and then they get bored with that different sound. If the first sound comes back, they'll pay attention to it again because it's different. And so, anything that you know is too is too much the same, we get bored, and our and our brains don't pay as much attention because why should it? Right? Like that's why you don't typically feel your clothes on your body once you've gotten dressed, because if you were constantly feeling your clothes, that's really distracting, right? You you habituate to the feeling of your clothes. You can feel them if you want, right? You can direct your attention to what do my socks feel like today? Um, but you don't just feel them all the time, most of the time, unless they're itchy or something. Um, but it's, yeah, it's the same thing with practice. When we stop practicing something for a while and we come back to it, it's it's new, it's novel, and we're going to pay more attention to it. and and solidify it in our brains yeah that's that's fascinating um so i think in your in one of your videos on your site and by the way we'll put links to molly's website and youtube channel because there's there's a lot of great content in there we can, only kind of, we can only scratch the surface <laughs> here um, but you use something uh, i'm not sure if you're still using it but something called an expanding schedule yeah. 
So you you, you start the spacing. I'll, I'll, I'll get a chance to practice some retrieval here. You get you you, st- you start with maybe a couple days break between something or every other day, yeah. if I'm not mistaken, and then that starts increasing to a week, two weeks. You know, so. It, it, there is some kind of logic to how you're laying out the breaks. It's not just, well, I took a week off of this and then a month off of that. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's the logic is when something's new, you forget it more, uh, you, you forget it more quickly. And so you need to sort of reinforce it. And then as you get better at it or it becomes more familiar, you want to leave it for longer. So yeah, when something is brand new, um, I typically practice it by it, I mean like a given passage or something or a given skill. I, I practice it usually for three days in a row. If it's, if it's pretty easy, it's only two. If it's really hard, maybe it's four, but let's say three on average. And then I take a day off from it. And then usually what I do is every other day, three times. So say Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And again, that's on average. Sometimes I just have to do Monday, Wednesday. Sometimes I feel like I have to do Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Sunday. Um, and then at that point, I take a week off from it to give give myself a, a chance to forget about it for longer. And then after a week, I come back. And usually after a week, I it depends. Sometimes I only do it like two days in a row because it's like, okay, yeah, this feels fine. Sometimes I do it three or four. I would say most typically it's two or three. Um, I, I experimented early on in the pandemic with coming back to it after a week and just practicing it for one day and then taking another week off. But what I found repeatedly was I would come back after a week off from a given passage and I would come up with some new fingering or some new bowing or some new something that made way more sense than what I was doing before. I was like, oh yeah, it's way easier with this fingering. And then I'm going to take a week off from it. That seemed like not a good idea. Like I need to reinforce this brand new fingering tomorrow. Um, And so that's Mm -hmm. why I usually do a couple days after a week off. And then after that, I take two weeks off typically. And when I come back to it after two weeks, usually I practice it for one day. I'm like, yep, this is fine. Okay. Um, if it's not fine, or again, I've come up with some new fingering, then I'll practice it, you know, for, for a couple of days. Um, and then, so my, my practice calendar is like lots of separate sections of different pieces. So, so you know, I typically will practice when I start something brand new, it's like a phrase ish. Sometimes it's one measure. Like I've definitely had just one measure. That's a really, really hard measure. Um, but more typically it's something like eight to 16 bars, let's say, and it filters through this schedule we were just talking about of taking days and weeks off. And then once things get to the place where I've taken two weeks off and come back to it, they feel like they're just kind of there in terms of my ability to play it. And so at that point, I sort of just wait for other passages to sort of catch up with each other um, until I have sort of adjacent passages in the music that have all sort of filtered through the schedule. And now I'm going to work on putting them together and practicing performing them since now I can play them. Now I have to practice actually being able to perform them on the spot. Mm -hmm. And I I mean, I'm I'm sure for a lot of people taking two weeks off a piece that they're getting ready to perform at a concert sounds next to insane. (laughs) I felt that way at first too, when I started doing this in early 2020 and I like, the only reason I was brave enough to do this is because there were no concerts because of the pandemic. Right. And the, when I came back after two weeks off, I was like, why can I just play this? Like I haven't played this in two weeks and it feels, it doesn't just feel okay. It feels great. That was so surprising to me, like so surprising. So yeah, it's, it's really, it's really strange. Related to what we were talking about before with the novelty and, you know, habituation, I, I have found that the, my phrasing tends to get a little better too, yeah. just because I'm actually more interested in listening to myself play a piece rather than, you know, if you hammer something for four weeks straight and you, you've played it, you know, an hour or two every single day, it's just, it's hard to be that interested in it unless it's, you know, it's, it's your, you know, favorite piece right like but even then i mean the time off it just seemed when you replay it the the phrasing seems more natural it feels like you're not working as hard to to make it sound expressive or however you want it to sound oh yeah absolutely i also find when i come back yes it's way more expressive but also i get new expressive ideas like what i thought two weeks ago about how i want to shape this phrase i'll come back to it but like, you know i don't know if that's actually working um and i i'll have new ideas or my mind has been opened to other possibilities that I didn't consider before. So yeah, that's a great point. Thanks for bringing that up. Mm -hmm. 
And I like and I also like the idea of doing it two days in a row because uh, I, w- I was sharing with um, Eric and Molly off air. I, did, I had a bad sleep last night. Just something interfered with my sleep. You know, Italian greyhounds uh, have they have the timbre that can pierce through walls and <laughs> earplugs. Something. Oh, that's I mean, terrible. We should, be re- we should be researching this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but but so I you know I did all this like practice during the day that was that was scheduled and interleaved and the optimal spacing and everything and then i just have a bad sleep i mean for me a bad sleep is six hours right it's not really that bad it's just it's not my full like yeah. eight or nine hours yeah. sleep yeah. and having two days in a row it kind of gives you some extra insurance uh against things like that and and again if you're changing things like fingering or making big decisions it gives you some extra uh window of time to to sort that stuff out yeah i have to say though so when I did this experiment on myself early in the pandemic, I the first schedule I did was, yeah, like I would take a week off and then just do it once and then take another week off. And I even though I realized that issue early on, like, oh, I just came up with a new fingering, like, I feel like I should practice this tomorrow. I stuck with my schedule because I was doing an experiment on myself. And like we were saying before, N of one, right? No, no control group or anything. But I was like, OK, I'm just going to stick with this to see sort of how it how it plays out. And then I did a sort of another experiment with the schedule that I use now with, you know, doing it a couple of days in a row. And I have to say, I didn't really notice a difference. So that's why I showed uh, Eric and Molly my practice board. I, I pretty much only practice the pieces one day a week. Yeah, like it was. <laughs> and sometimes I'll do some random, like the neck, if I just practice a Bach piece on Monday, on Tuesday, I might do some random practice and just randomly insert a phrase that was challenging into that session. Yeah. But I mean, I, I didn't really notice much of a difference so i've kind of you know <laughs> yeah just stuck with it this. was like even when i would like change a fingering even if it was a pretty big fingering change and like okay well i'm gonna take a week off let's see what happens it was it stuck the next week so i don't know i was i was surprised i was surprised by that so did you have the insight after this experimenting like i did where you're like oh my goodness i sp- i've spent so much time over practicing yep <laughs> I, so I used to be somebody, I would never, ever, 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 ever take days off. Like when I was an undergrad, my, my teacher in undergrad called my mom at one point because he knew that we were going on like a long weekend vacation as a family. And he called my mom and he said, Molly is not allowed to bring her viola on vacation. She needs to take some days off. I was so mad. I was like, Mr. Sloak, you can't call my mom. Like that's out of bounds. But that's how adamant I was about. I must practice every single day. Now I take Sundays off always every single week. I've been doing that since the beginning of the pandemic um, because I feel like when I come back on Monday, it's it's just so much better than when I was doing every single day without without a day off. I used to. Yeah, I used to try to practice everything I was working on every day, which like, how does that even work? You don't have enough time in the day. And when I did this spaced practice experiment on myself early in 2020 almost immediately i was like oh my god (laughs) i've been way over practicing my whole life to to no effect right and like this is just so much better i'm never ever going back to how i used to practice yeah i I think some of these in these insights and conversations also they help illuminate why maybe self-taught musicians or musicians on their own schedules seem to be learning at radical speeds yeah I mean, musician like when i was younger there was no logic in what i was doing in terms of the spacing like it was not intentional at all but i was doing a lot of this stuff right you know i i, I practice a piece very intensely um or a series of pieces for a few days and then i just drop it for a week and just like you know focus more on uh, other pieces or just like hang out with my friends or whatever and then you come back to it but you it, it's it's almost silly to see that there are natural kind of experiments of this in the wild that show up and uh yeah for me it was very illuminating to why my my teenage self was very productive but not very intentional or organized (laughs) yeah no that's interesting i mean i started recognizing this sort of subconsciously too when so i teach at the university of arizona now but i used to teach at the university of wisconsin eau claire and i was teaching in addition to viola i was teaching theory and aural skills and i had like no time to practice between teaching all those classes, grading the homework, planning for class, like I just did not have time to practice. And so I couldn't do my practice every day like I was used to. Like I would go for weeks and weeks without touching my viola outside of demonstrating in lessons. And, you know, or I'd have like half an hour to practice here. And then like three days later, I'd have, you know, 20 minutes or something. And I had such minimal practice time 
but I was able to learn music like just fine. And like, you know, I'd come back to it and it would feel fine. And yeah, so even before I did this experiment in early 2020, I had had that experience of like, wow, I'm really not practicing a lot and I'm having to take a lot of time off, but it's somehow fine. That's what's so counterintuitive about this is because musicians, like especially professional musicians who've been playing their whole life, we've had many experiences where right. we drop a piece for a week or two and it gets better. Right. But there's often not an acknowledgement of harnessing that intentionally. Oh, totally. Um, yeah. I, yeah. I can't tell you the number of times. So before the pandemic, I was giving like presentations like live in front of people rather than on Zoom very frequently. And at the end of presentations, people would come up to me to, you know, ask follow up questions and Almost every time people would be like, so I had this really weird experience. I got really sick and I couldn't practice for a whole week. And then I came back and my music was so much better or some variant on that experience. I think every single musician has had an experience of that where you take time off unintentionally, you come back and it's way better. And yet we don't think to do it intentionally as a strategy because it just feels way too risky. It feels like it's a fluke when it happens rather than like an actual principle of how we learn. It's so useful as a teacher to know this too, because if if you have a, I mean, I teach a lot of beginners, and a lot of them are struggling with building practice habits to begin with. But when you tell a student, uh, like I have a couple of students right now who are preparing for exams, and I'll tell them, look, like take an index card, put three boxes on it. All I want you to do is to is on one day of the week, you choose the day of the week, practice this piece three times, and there has to be at least an hour or two gap between the two. And I don't care if you do it for five minutes or whatever. And the freedom that this gives people, it, it for because I think you and I are more on the spectrum of like, we needed people to pull us away from our instruments. I, mean, yeah. I had tendonitis when I was younger and all uh, nerve issues. Yep. But, yep. but for a lot of people, they're, they're, they struggle with the discipline of it. But I mean, people inherently will, will respond people will resist arbitrary discipline. And yeah. so when one of my students sees, well, I only really, really need to practice this a little bit for it to be, you know, pretty good. It's hard to convince them at that point that you should be practicing every day, but also encouraging students like, you know, you don't have to go crazy with this. You know, you might want to put 20 minutes or half an hour in over the course of a day, but I only need you to practice this one or two days a week if it's spaced like this. And right. I've seen really good results behaviorally with, with, with opening a bit of autonomy yeah. on that. Uh, I mean, I That's rarely cool. ask to see the index card with the with the checks on it, but it, yeah, I think it just helps people feel like they have a bit more freedom. Or even if if students are learning as a hobby, like maybe an adult student, like telling them it's okay if you don't have time to practice every single day. You know, right. if, if you're trying to play for pleasure and enjoyment, it, there's not necessarily a reason you have to do that. Uh, and I, I I think that goes a long way in, in helping people you know, stick with their musical projects. Oh, definitely. I've had, I've had parents come up to me after presentations, dragging their children saying, please tell my child he needs to practice every single day for X amount of time. And I'm like, actually, and I, I launch into this and the kid is looking at their parents, see mom, see mom. And the parent is like horrified that I'm, you know, justifying their kid, not practicing every day and not doing like five hours at once. It, yeah. Yeah. There's a couple of things that. like, yeah. Go ahead, Eric. Go I'm ahead. sorry. There's a couple things that come up for me. One is as a teacher, like my instrument is the children. Like that's what I practice. And I do this lesson. And by the end of the week, I've taught that lesson at various stages, you know, from one to eight year olds or whatever. And I just uh, by the end of the week and then a lot of that stuff goes on to the next week, but it's lightly touched. And then eventually I let it rest and I bring it back. So it's like the thing that you kind of naturally uh drawn to do sometimes I think as a teacher like I'm I'm not practicing an instrument like this and you know someday right I'll, I'll have the while I in the days that I was practicing so that's one piece it's like the, the instrument is the children and I'm honing my skill in that and then letting it go and then why I need summers off right you know because I just want to and I love the feeling uh of the second day of teaching the first day of teaching back at school in the fall it's is chaos. just i just hate it you know and even more the week before but um but you know summer's off versus and this other thing that comes up is like year-long school with more breaks you know where they have you know two weeks off here two weeks off there and a week off more than anybody else gets and or having that nine month school year um where's the research on that and what what is you know because that's 
every kid. Yeah, that's a really good point. I lived in Germany for a year and I taught at the International School of Stuttgart, which was on sort of the, the more typical German school schedule, which is every six weeks you get a week off. Um, and yeah, it was amazing. So every, every, <laughs> six weeks, every six weeks you get a week off. They, they have, and yeah, they just have way more time off. Summer is shorter. It's only like July and August rather than like June, July, August. Like, in, you know, so summer is shorter, but every six weeks we got a week off. There were a lot of other like small holidays. Um, I think at Easter or something, we got two weeks off. I don't remember anymore. This was like 10 years ago, but like, it was such a great schedule because even though we didn't get these huge vacations like we do in the school system of the United States of really long summer break, um, I never felt like like I was going for weeks and weeks feeling like, oh my God, I need I need time off. Like the six week mark would come and be like, oh, we get a week off. Oh yeah, that's nice. But I didn't feel like I, I needed a week off. Whereas in the American education system, I have always felt like Right now we have two weeks till spring break and I've needed spring break since like two weeks ago. Um, you know, and in the American education system, I've just always felt that, that you're just like, just get me to spring break, just get me to summer break, just get me to Christmas break because it's so long without a break. And yeah, it was such a better schedule. And I felt that the kids, the kids did better too. They learned better because they were getting these really frequent breaks from school. They also had recess twice a day, which was... yeah. February is always my hardest month, it seems like every year. Um, hmm. One other thing that came up to me before Bo started teaching me about your stuff uh, was I was always trying to capture flow in my practice, like chasing, you know, set me high's notion of flow. Like, I want to get to that point. And I'm like, okay, well, that was good. And then you go back and you just, you're always trying to, maybe we shouldn't be, shouldn't be, after that during practice, we should be after it in our work habit during practice, maybe, or like, you know, the flow of, of interruption, <laughs> the flow of changing and interrupting yourself, or like, um, <clears throat> save that for when you're on the bandstand, <clears throat> and then try to, you know, let it, let it go. I wonder what the intersection of, you know, that notion of flow and, and practice and performance how those interact or something. I, yeah, I'm just curious. This is all fascinating to me. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think like ideally we want to be in flow when we're performing, right? So because when you're in flow, things just feel effortless and you're not worried about, you're not worried about anything actually. You're not worried about yourself, but you're you're very focused on what you're doing. And when you're in flow, you feel like you feel like you can take risks because you know that you can do them. They won't actually be risks. Um, whereas I, I have to say, I'm, I've only been in flow and performance, I think maybe two or three times in my life. Um, I rarely, rarely, rarely experience that in performance, which is unfortunate, but that's a whole other conversation. Um, in terms of in the practice room, I would say for me, I, so there's sort of two categories of practice, large categories of practice for me. One is learning how to do the thing and then figuring out how to perform the thing, if we're gonna put it in very large categories. And when I'm f learning how to do the thing, I don't think I'm ever really in flow because I'm grappling with, I can't play this, right? And it can feel frustrating and, it can, and you're, you, you're sort of actively problem solving and you're trying to push yourself to, you know, slightly outside of your comfort zone of, you know, I can't do this. How am I going to be able to do this? So I'm, I'm, I enjoy that process, but I wouldn't say I'm in flow when I'm doing that in the other very large category of, okay, now I have to practice performing this, which is a different skill from being able to just do it. I want to try to get into flow when I'm doing that because I'm trying to make it feel like I want it to feel when I'm performing. I've had many more experiences of being in a flow when I'm practicing performing at home when there's no people watching me and it doesn't matter than I've been in flow like in an actual performance. Um, but yeah, that's that's a really yeah, that's a really good question. I think that if you're I don't know, if you're in flow when you're when you're doing the I'm trying to learn how to do this, you're not really actively problem solving and sort of grappling with the I can't do this and this is really hard and the a, a certain amount of 
frustration is necessary to learn. That's also another hard thing to wrap your, your mind around. Like I teach my students like that feeling of like, oh God, why can't I do this? I just want to be able to do that. That's what learning feels like. And it's not necessarily a good feeling, um, but it is necessary to learn. Um, and that is not even remotely what flow feels like. You don't feel that like, oh, I wish I could do this, but I can't feeling. You see this with uh, Anders Ericsson's research on deliberate practice. Mm -hmm. People are typically not in flow while right. they're practicing because it, it involves this inherently, you know, frustrating process of trying to do something you can't do. And That's right. I, I can't remember where I heard this, but I, I've heard that I heard somewhere that that frustration that arises when trying to master a challenge and um, it could potentially releases a seal choline that actually helps encode the memory better. Right. Yeah. It, it that frustration causes changes in the neurochemistry. You may, do you listen to the humor Huberman Lab podcast? Yeah, I, I it's been a little while, but I was I was completely up to date on his podcast for a long time. <laughs> I was too, and I'm so not. I'm like two years not up to date. But he has a really great episode talking about that, talking specifically about why frustration is necessary. And the sort of neurochemical changes that happen when you when you reach that point of frustration, and that that's the point that you have to keep going rather than giving up, which is what we usually want to do. Which is why I try to tell my students like that's what learning feels like. Like it doesn't feel good, but it's what learning feels like. You have to keep going. You can't stop when you when you feel that. I think that's actually where I heard uh, of that from. And this for me, this is another one of these countercultural. Um, insights that come up because a lot of people have this idea well learning feels should feel good you're playing music you're passionate about music the project should just feel like you know puppies and rainbows <laughs> um but but similar to like mindset interventions like where you you help coach someone into a growth mindset or a mindset that's is 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 supportive of positive types of stress i found that when students are at that frustration threshold when they're just about there it, it's very uh, useful to do a little mindset intervention and say look this is good there's right. a chemical being released in your brain right now and you can kind of you know you can almost treat this like a game and it, this is okay you're just you're now at this level and there's a new strategy and i've had really good results with um pointing that out to students right yeah uh, me a lot too of people seem yeah people seem more willing to kind of uh, adopt that frustration and not and and i think more importantly realize it's it's something that's not wrong with them or right. the way their relationship with music is it's just part of you know, you're trying to get the skill down and you have some skin in the game here. You care about it. Totally. Yeah, I will point that out in lessons. Like when we're working on something and I can tell the student has gotten to that level, I'll say, okay, what you're feeling right now, this is what learning feels like. And mm. if you were in the practice room by yourself, you'd probably give up right now. And they're like, yeah. Um, but pointing it out when I witness it in a lesson, yeah, I agree with you. It can be really powerful to sort of change students' relationship with that feeling. And that I think this is a little bit of a tangent, but the idea of talent is so damaging. And a lot of students who go into music, especially, you know, in college, they were told at some point in their lives, oh, you're really talented at this, or like, you know, you're meant to be a musician. And that message can be so damaging, because when inevitably, they reach that frustration threshold that you have to reach in order to learn, they feel like, oh, I must not be talented. I must not be good at this. Maybe I shouldn't. Maybe I'm not cut out for this because this is hard for me, because I feel frustrated and it's not fun. And it's just like, no, you have to feel that to learn. Uh, I, I think you're right on there because uh, my own experience when I was younger, I was very talented guitarist growing up, but I had a hard time really ad adopting, you know, like studying a program and really pushing myself it, it to and stretching myself to what I was actually capable of. And I think had someone, you know, maybe had had someone offered these mindset shifts because uh, what we're talking about is having a growth mindset, mindset towards right. towards effort. I mean, right. Um, generally, I th is this Carol Dweck's research? Car Carol Dweck, yeah, that's right. Yeah, generally telling people like, oh, you're so good, you're talented, that's why you're good. It tends to reduce the amount of effort they That's put right. into the project. So it, it can backfire in a way. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah. Yeah. It doesn't do anybody any good to tell, to, to use the word talent. Kids that are so-called talented, it damages them. Kids like me who are not talented, it also damages them. Oh, you're not talented. There's no point in trying. No, that's not, no, that's not true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so we, we talked a little bit about sleep and practice and you have uh, some great information uh, on your YouTube channel and your website about that. One thing I haven't heard you talk about is the relationship between exercise and practice. And I've I've done some experimentation with this, but even the other day I'm working on 
uh, a Bach piece and I, I, I did my big session in the morning, with the little one in the afternoon. But, but after the afternoon one, I went for a pretty intense run. And when I came back in the evening, there was a dramatic shift in how well I could play it. And not not what I normally see in my in my spacing of three times a day. Like it was quite noticeable how much the fluency got boosted. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious about your, your thoughts on maybe timing exercise, because I think there's some there's some ta- there's some idea about like whether it's before or after the learning session and maybe even I, I heard something about it being like if it's four hours after potentially that could be a really good idea but there's there's a lot of stuff to play around with here right yeah I I can't speak on this very well because this isn't an area of the research that I know very well um Andrew Huberman also has a great podcast episode on specifically this that um yeah that if you if you exercise after after you've practiced and you really get a lot of adrenaline in your system and that helps solidify what you've just learned. Um, but I don't know, I don't know that research personally. So I'll just say, go listen to Andrew Huberman because <laughs> he, he has a great podcast episode on that. You may be able to help us a little bit though with this because the, the theory for why this works is, uh, I think one of the leading theories is brain derived neurotropic factor. What is that? <laughs> It's, it, it's just, there's all sorts of chemicals in our brains that do different things. Um, yeah. Yeah. and they, there's all sorts of chemicals in our brains that sort of, um, you know, boost learning or boost retention. I mean, I guess that's the same thing. Um, and yeah, that, I mean, that's one of, it's one of the chemicals that we need in order, in order to learn and, and retain things. So I, I often wondered if that's why people get these learning effects from drinking caffeine, because caffeine, it, it causes this cascade of like, you know, physical, I don't know if you want to, it's a type of physical stress in a sense, not necessarily horrible for you, but it's boosting up the cardio system. And I've often wondered if, if that's the benefit that people get from drinking caffeine with, with its role with memory, if it's simulating some of these effects we get with exercise, possibly. It could be. It could also be that it just makes people more awake so they're more focused because if you're practicing and you're not focused you're not going to retain something i'm thinking speaking about naps um last week noah kageyama's podcast or last week or maybe the week before it was (laughs) why naps are better than coffee um i remember which was which was funny timing because we had literally i'm teaching a class right now here at the university on the neuroscience of practicing we had just maybe a week prior talked about that in class that students were like well can't i just drink coffee and i was like well um so, I mean, you could do the coffee nap where you have your 20 minute nap. You, you drink your coffee, you have a 20, 20 minute nap. The caffeine doesn't hit your bloodstream for 20 minutes there anyway. So it's not going to, I mean, th- this is what happens when you start getting into this. You, you, you turn into your own lab rat. That's right. I'll uh, leave you to, I don't, I don't drink caffeine. It makes me crazy. Oh, I, interesting. So you don't drink caffeine. The only thing I drink is water. I'm kind of boring when it comes to drinking things. Yeah. I, caffeine caffeine makes me insane i think probably because i don't drink it ever but if i have caff i like don't sleep for two days yeah caffeine and i'm like bouncing off the walls i already talk really really fast and it just makes that even worse and i feel like i'm gonna have a heart attack it's not good i'm a new caffeine drinker it's only been the past couple of years eric's seen me when i drink too much caffeine i don't think he particularly enjoys it i'm quite serious of cutting it off though at 7 or 8 a.m. even I'm, I'm quite paranoid of, of it interfering with my sleep yeah but actually when I when I found your work and you got me into Matthew Walker's why we sleep yeah. I actually experimented with cutting caffeine for quite a long time and it was funny the reason I cut caffeine was to try to make my naps better oh that's interesting <laughs> And I didn't really notice a difference. I didn't notice I was, uh, I normally don't completely fall asleep during a nap anyway, but I, I didn't really notice any difference. And and so I, you know, my caffeine addiction is still uh, very much alive in my life. But I, I was curious about that with, with you. Yeah, I've never, um, I've never in my entire life been a caffeine, a, a coffee drinker or caffeine drinker. Never, ever. I just, yeah, no. A sip of it makes me stay up for two, three more hours. Just a sip in the morning. I can't do it. Right. Yeah. My mom yeah. is the same. She used to be able to drink coffee, you know, kind of whatever she wanted throughout the day. And at some point, maybe 20 years ago now, she, yeah, she can't drink it after a certain time in the day. Otherwise, she, she can't sleep at night. But yeah, it just, even a small amount makes me crazy. So another thought I had about, so what the condition um, of the child that I'm teaching when they're in front of me. And I've always been a jokester with them because they're two, three, four years old, the bulk of my kids. 
Um, and I always, you know, if they're alive and laughing and happy that there's less cortisol, but maybe there needs to be that little bit, of course, you know, they're learning. So, but is there, is it easier that young to uh, absorb the stress if you've got that you know, freedom to, to play? Yeah, I mean, there is a lot of research that, that shows that everybody, but definitely kids, learn better when what they're trying to learn is is embedded in play and games and, and things like that. I was, a, I was a Suzuki teacher for many years before I started teaching at the collegiate level, so I taught lots of little kids. And I, with them, I would take these sort of principles of learning that I know from the research and be like, okay, how can I make this into a game? Um, and like everything we did in lessons, we just, we just, for, from their perspective, all we did was play games in lessons. Um, but it was, you know, the, these principles of, of interleaving or, or doing repetitions or variable practice, you know, and they would say, Miss Molly, can I play this game at home? I'm like, yes, that's the point, that, <laughs> that you'll want to play these games when you go home so that your practicing is more effective. Um, but, I mean, kids learn differently than adults somewhat. The, the neurochemistry of children's brains is... I mean, kids are like sponges, right? Like they pick up stuff that you're like, how did you, even? like that was like a throwaway comment and you're remembering it like three years later and they just absorb, like my brother went through a dinosaur phase where he knew like everything about dinosaurs, right? And it's kids, the, the neurochemistry of their brains is just different because the role of a child is to learn as much as they possibly can. And then at a certain point when we're in like our mid twenties, that neurochemistry changes and so we as adults have to be much more intentional about learning and making sure we're you know focused and awake and concentrating and doing all the stuff we've been talking about today whereas kids they just kind of like <laughs> take things in much more automatically but yeah using humor games that's that's a that's a really great way to teach that's backed up by research and they sleep better so they're they're, they're uh, right the encoding the encoding of everything is just Right. Well, kids yeah. need more, a lot more sleep than adults too. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wanted to segue into, you know, your experience a, a little bit as a Suzuki teacher, because I've heard you talk about this, uh, just only a small amount, but you know, what do, what do you think the benefit is to um, delaying reading music, especially for instrumentalists when you're young and you're, you know, cause there's a lot of going on. You're, you're trying to learn to audit the music properly and you, you have all these motor things you're trying to learn and hopefully you're learning how to fuse that with what you're audiating but adding you know a visual component on this too early in the process i mean eric and i are giant fans of delaying reading um and i, I remember you saying you were but i i'd be very curious to hear your perspective on this i have very strong thoughts on this so um one thing that i started to notice well suzuki kids myself included we just stuff just gets memorized. You don't have to like, tr I don't have to try to memorize stuff. It just gets memorized. And that's what I saw in all of my, all of my Suzuki friends growing up, like memorizing music was really no big deal. And what I started to notice when I started teaching is that I could identify kids that had been Suzuki trained or trained in some sort of um, tradition like bluegrass or something that, that teaches by ear. I could identify kids who had been trained in that, uh, in that tradition simply by how easily they memorized or not. Um, and kids that are that learn to read like as their first experience with music typically have a really hard time memorizing music. They also have a much harder time um, hearing intonation or paying attention to their sound and things like that. And for a, for a long time, it was just like, oh, this is an interesting observation. I wonder, I wonder what's up with that. Um, but then I started discovering research that doesn't test this directly. I would love to test this at some point in my life, but I need access to an fMRI machine. So, um, But they've found that um, professional musicians, uh, they did this with violinists, when they would silently finger a piece they knew how to play well, their auditory cortex in their brain was also active. And normally the auditory cortex is only active when you're hearing stuff. They didn't see this auditory cortex activation in amateur musicians, just, just the professionals. On the flip side, uh, research done with pianists, they found that when they played a recording to, to pianists of a piece they knew how to play well, their motor cortex was active 
And usually the motor cortex is only active when you're moving. And it wasn't just generally active. It was active in the very specific way it would have to be if they were playing the piece. So these were pianists. So if the thumb would play a given note, the thumb area was active. If the pinky would play a given note, the pinky area was active. It was very specific activation to how you would actually play it. So this, it's called a um, motor, uh, auditory motor coactivation that these two areas get coactivated in the brain. And I have this sort of pet theory that in Suzuki kids and other kids that are trained by ear from the beginning that they're not reading music, that this auditory motor connection forms at a very young age. Whereas when you learn to read music from the beginning, the connection that gets formed is between the motor cortex and the visual cortex and the auditory cortex is sort of left out of it. Um, which that is would, kind which of is, crazy. Which is kind of that. crazy, but that would match up with my observations, right? That like Suzuki trained kids or other, other kids that learn by ear, they memorize really, really easily. They have a much easier time paying attention to intonation and sound because if what they're doing physically is sort of fused with what it sounds like, all that makes sense, right? That it would be easy to pay attention to sound or intonation or memorize. Whereas if the visual cortex and the motor cortex are what are communicating and the auditory cortex is sort of left out of it, having to pay attention to intonation or sound, that's an extra thing on top of all the complications of playing. Of course, it's going to be hard to pay attention to that. Um, if the visual is fused with the motor and you take away the visual, you take away the music, what you're left with is motor memory, which is it's implicit memory. We don't have good ac um, conscious access to that. And so that's why kids feel like, I don't know what the notes are because the, the, the conscious thing that they have had all this time, the visual stimulus of the music, is not there anymore. So they feel like they don't, they don't know how to play it. Um, so I think I've even heard this going in the direction where some people, when they think of memorizing music, they memorize visually what the sheet what it looks, like. looks like, which is, which seems crazy to me. I mean, I, I grew up, I, I was not Suzuki trained, but I grew up playing by ear for years Yeah, and learning a piece means memorizing it to me. Right. There's, there, I can't learn a piece and not, not memorize, memorize it. Like, like there's, or, or learn how to sing it or like the, those things happen simultaneously. Yeah, totally. They're, they're, and as a Suzuki teacher, I would see this repeatedly, and even though I saw it like countless times, it never ceased to amaze me. Like you start a little kid and you're teaching them by rote, essentially, like this is how you play this. And then at a certain point, very early on, they will just, if they know how it goes, they'll know how to play it. Um, like I remember once I was teaching this little girl, she was, she was four and, um, I came, I, I went to her house to teach her. I got to her house and it was the day that I had planned to start introducing Song of the Wind, which is the third song in Suzuki book one. So she's very, very early beginner, little, little girl. And I started introducing it and she goes, Miss Molly, I know how to play that song. And I was like, you do? I haven't taught it to you yet. She's like, I know how to play it. And I was like, okay, show me. And so she did and she played it perfectly. And you know, part of me was like, how did you do that? But the other part of me was like, this is how Suzuki's supposed to work. She's been listening to the recordings, you know, every day, like she's supposed to. She knows how it goes. And so she can figure out how to play it. And no matter how many times I saw that play out, that kids would just get to a point where they could just hear something and they could play something. It never ceases to amaze me that it's, I mean, it never ceases to amaze me that it's possible to learn anything. I just think it's like <laughs> kind of amazing in and of itself. But that to me is like, that's the auditory motor connection that she could hear it. Therefore, she could automatically play it because she knew how the sound was matching up to, to what to do. So I think all kids should learn how to play by ear for at least the first six months of learning an instrument. There should be no music reading whatsoever. Or if there's music reading, it's totally separate from the instrument. It's just music literacy, right? But it's not at all connected to the instrument. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the ways I've thought about this is... I mean, if you look at this just in terms of working memory, there is an a, there is a general ability to kind of focus on a visual thing and and a and a kinesthetic thing at the same time. But when you're intentionally learning something, you have a limited amount of working memory slots. That's right. And if you're filling those up, and the visual cortex is so massive in our experience, it's right? Really right. quite in comparison to sound and kinesthetic feelings, the visual experience is just boom. It's very big. Yep. And by by putting the auditory cortex at the bottom of these three systems, there's not a lot of working memory left to even get the thing going. And I think that's why the, the, the Suzuki practice of just listening to the recordings, even without the instrument, 
it's getting to the root of you know what moves the needle you need to focus on the sound even without the instrument is helpful especially in the beginning and, and which mirrors how we learn language i mean we don't we we have we have kids listen to a lot of language before we give we don't give kids tongue exercises you know when they're <laughs> right. when they're young it's mostly a listening phenomenon and then they start exploring and you know so i mean it sounds like we're all very much on the same yeah page i mean with that and that that was dr suzuki's big insight was all kids learn to speak their native language just by hearing it around them why can't they learn music the same way that was his sort of big insight that changed how kids were taught music mm -hmm. yeah no i think that's i think that's fascinating and it's interesting how um uh, suzuki kind of brought this into the classical world where i think this was very common for guitar players it's really common totally. to play with i mean just culturally guitar players um even if you are a classical guitarist it's very likely you're going to spend a lot of time playing by ear and improvising it's just baked into what guitar teachers get students to do and a lot of drum teachers are like that too but when you get into more kind of you know classical geared lessons um a lot of uh piano teachers wouldn't have students learning things by ear or or if it is it's kind of last minute for a, a, like an oral skills thing it's 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 tangential to the you know the project of learning right yeah yeah so well i you know i want to be conscious of your time molly i i have a feeling you know, you're one of these individuals we could just never stop the podcast. <laughs> likely, we must, likely. We, 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 we must stop at some point. Um, so the last thing I wanted to mention quickly is, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your book and the process, the, the timeline that we can expect? Because I, I would be very excited to read it. I'm sure many other people would be as well. Yeah. So for the last two years, I've been writing a book on the neuroscience of practicing for Oxford University Press. Um, I turned in my finished manuscript on February 1st, so that's very exciting. Um, the projected release date is March 2024, um, but I have no idea how the whole book publishing thing works because I've obviously never written a book before. Um, I don't know what happens at this point in terms of the process, So, but that's, that's the timeline. Um, in terms of the contents of the book, it's everything we've been talking about, um, all the stuff that I talk about on my YouTube channel videos, but like also so much more stuff that I haven't been able to talk about and more in depth. And yeah, it's really, it's really exciting. I've, this project has been sort of in the back of my mind for a long time. And it's, it's very exciting that it exists now, right? I've turned it in. So now they just have to make well, it into an actual book. Yeah. Even on your, your YouTube comments, everyone's like, when are you writing a book? <laughs> I know. Well, you know, I got that question for years when I would do presentations and for years it was like, I don't have time to write a book. And then Early on in the pandemic, it, it was like, yeah, I think it was March or April 2020, um, Noah Kageyama had me on his his podcast to talk about memorization. And it was it was it wasn't really a podcast. It was this like live thing. It wasn't Zoom. It was some other platform. And there were literally a thousand people there. It was crazy. And at the end, everybody was writing in the chat, you need to write a book, you need to write a book, you need to write a book. And Noah was like, Molly, I think you need to write a book. And I was like, actually, I think I do. And now is the time because I don't have any concerts and I don't have to practice. So actually, in the last two years, I've practiced so little compared to what I normally do because I've been writing a book instead. But it seems like a good time to do it, right? So... And the last question I wanted to ask you, like, do you have any interest or plans in the future of, of running experiments on, on practicing? Uh, because I, I, yeah, I think you should. Think I about think that. I should too. I, I have a whole, I have a whole note in my notes app in my phone that says practicing experiments. And I just, you know, I'm constantly thinking, Oh, but somebody should do this. Somebody should do this. And, uh, yes, the, the issue is like, it, the way research works, it, there's so much red tape, there's so much bureaucracy, there's so much stuff around like funding and grants and blah, blah, blah. Um, but it, it, the answer is yes. Hopefully at some point in my life, I'll, I'll get to do that because I have a huge long list of things I'd like to do. I wonder if there's any like <clears throat> possibility here for some type of crowdsourced um, a, a ability to run an experiment, at least at a you know, at, at an informal level before you moved into like a formal type of right. like, getting a I've, and stuff. I've thought of that too, that like a lot of the experiments I want to do involve sticking people in an fMRI machine and that <laughs> cannot be crowdsourced. But in terms of money, yeah, exactly. And access to an fMRI machine. 
Um, but in terms of like purely behavioral experiments, like it seems like there, there's enough people in the world that are interested in this kind of thing that would be like, oh yeah, like I, I would be, I would be willing to be, you know, an informal research subject in, in something like that. Yeah. Maybe that's something I should think more seriously about because yeah, I think you're right. There's a lot of things that could just be done sort of informally to get some like, you know, beta test things or something. Especially if we could design things where people acted as their own control mm. would be very would be very interesting because yeah. I mean, a lot of these things we're talking about are just generally healthy for you. I mean, I'm, right. I'm running more. I'm running more and cycling more to try to increase my practice gains. I mean, and that I mean, that probably has I know that has an effect on my sleep and, and, and other areas of life. And yeah, so it's, it's interesting that uh, often the things that make you better at learning are just generally good for you, you as, as well. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Right. No, that's a good idea, actually. Yeah, I'll think more about that. Um, crowdsourcing think, experiments. Yeah, I mean, maybe maybe this is something that, you know, the, these podcast platforms that you're on could help organize at some point. That's a good idea. I, I'm sure there's lots of musicians who would. I'm sure there are, that. too. I just have to get I would just have to find somebody to do the statistical analysis because I can't do that myself. I'm, I'm with you. Then. Nor would I want to. That, that... <laughs> Well, it was it was a lovely conversation. I think uh, it would be a, it would be a lot of fun to have you back maybe in a year or so when your when your book launches. I'd I love to. That'd, that'd be a, a lot of fun for all of us. This is all very fascinating. I love it so much. It's made a huge difference. Um, just watching you um, in your videos, they're a treasure trove. So thank, thank you, you so much. For Thanks for that. having me. Yeah. It's it's always fun to talk to people about this stuff. I I don't know when I started really talking about this and presenting about this. I didn't think anybody would be interested in it. I thought it was just my little dorky thing that I loved. And it's like, oh my gosh, other people find this fascinating too. So it's always, yeah, it's always really fun to talk about it. Yeah. When I, when I talk to my wife about this stuff, she doesn't seem particularly interested, but once in a while you find a, uh, a musician who's, you know, they're trying to squeeze everything they can out of their practice. Right. All right. Well, I think that's a great place to wrap up. Thanks so much.